Hello, everyone. Hi. This is very strange. This is my first time running the show here at the Lunch and Learns on Seed and Spark. Um, so forgive me if I stumble a little bit. My name is Clay Pruitt. I am Seed and Spark's head of acquisitions and programming. Um, we'd first like to acknowledge the land we are all on is occupied territory. And please uh, check out the first comment on our YouTube comments uh, to link um, to a COVID relief fund uh, and a website that will tell you more about the names of the indigenous people's land uh, you are on. Uh, if you are not familiar with Seed and Spark, we are a platform built to support creators by providing tools for wherever you are in your journey, from crowdfunding and education to creative distribution approaches. Uh, today, we are um, diving into the topic of online festivals and how, to, uh, how they might bring their audiences um, aboard for the online experience. So um, I am really thrilled to have with us today to uh, have this lovely conversation uh, from Cineola, Daniel Diaz. Uh, from Oxford Film Festival, Melanie Addington, and from Women's Sports Film Festival, Susan Sullivan. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I am excited to, to dive into this. So um, to kick things off, uh, I would just love for each of you to um, in introduce yourselves and uh, your festival and maybe talk a little bit about what your sort of core mission is um, of your festival. Um, we'll start with uh, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, Kay. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Diaz. I'm the founder of Cineola. So we are a platform for Latin American stories. We're based in San Francisco. And our mission is essentially to connect audiences with diverse kind of nuanced representations of Latin America on film. Um, the festival is kind of one aspect of that. And yeah, the recent kind of online version that, that we ran on the Seed and Spark platform um, kind of showcased this selection of, of short documentary films from the region. Great. Uh, Melanie? Hey, I'm Melanie Addington with Oxford Film Festival. That's Oxford, Mississippi, not England, hence no accent. Um, and we get that a lot. And, I was um, gonna say, you've said this before. <laughs> yeah. um, our mission is basically to celebrate independent film and we do that lots of different ways. Uh, right now it's through a drive-in and a virtual fest. And uh, we also help people make movies. So. And Susan. Hi, um, my name is Susan Sullivan, and I am the founder of the Women's Sports Film Festival, which is a documentary film festival celebrating female athletes, as the name would imply. And um, our mission is to reimagine sports with women and girls at the center of the story. Um, this is the fourth anniversary of the festival. Four years ago today, we were in a fest in a, in a live setting. <laughs> so, day. yeah, uh, actually, yeah. this would have been day. Two. So yesterday was the first, it was a three day festival. And so this is kind of the middle. Uh, and we launched our first online um, monthly series of three films called Rewind, which was watching actually films from that first uh, year. Last week, we had a 10 day run and are preparing to move our, uh, what would have been our live festival online in September. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. So I want to, sort of go through this a little bit chronologically if if we can um so to to start off i i'd, I'd like to hear a little bit um i think it, it's hard at least for me to think about like how we've always been sort of an online society uh prior to the pandemic because it feels like it is so all-encompassing now uh <laughs> that it's sort of like oh yeah we did a little bit of this before um, I'd like to hear uh, from your perspectives about sort of what work you had previously done pre-pandemic um, in terms of utilizing online resources to cultivate uh, communication and audience building um, pipeline um, through, through online resources. I'll, I'll start. Um, 
So I was a social media director for a magazine before I took on this position. So social media has always been instrumental for our festival. Um, however, it was always supplementary trying to drive community around a physical event. So suddenly pivoting to, okay, ignore all that for the past 16 years and now we're all virtual was a really um, tricky transition because just like theaters, we live in a space where we focus on the physical act of interacting with others. Um, and so we very much had to put the message out that this is what we're doing right now. And this is something that we will look to do in the future for those who can't physically come together, but we're not just breaking our mission. We're not moving away from the idea of eventually getting back into the theater, um, which we felt was a really important message to say, we're using these tools that we always use because that's all we have right now, but it's just one part, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, Susan or, or Daniel, anything that you had done sort of previously? I mean, I know Daniel, you're, you're fairly new in, in, in sort of cultivating that audience, so, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. In terms of what we kind of done prior, specifically with Cineola, not a lot to be honest with you. This was very much our, you know, first edition, and we had everything kind of in place for an in-person event in April here in San Francisco. You know, everything from you know the dates were set, the program venues, everything already confirmed, um, and you know, I guess a, a lot of that was based around the fact that. This was, you know, essentially designed to be a very kind of like locally focused kind of like grassroots event, especially in its, you know, in its inception at least. Um, and so for us, it really kind of represented a, a complete shift, honestly. I think we made the call very early on, um, maybe early March, mid-March, when it kind of became apparent that the direction things were headed with the pandemic. Um, and that allowed us to essentially avoid kind of announcing it publicly. So there wasn't any anything in the way of kind of having to walk back any, you know, any announcements or any like previous marketing. Um, and then essentially just kind of kind of sat with it on hold and kind of started to put together a plan and almost just kind of like watch and learn from what other festivals were doing um, before before yeah, eventually making the call to to kind of push for for an online version. Right. So we were super local and I, of course, you know, was using social media and had it on my newsletter. And um, however, our, our primary community building strategy was to um, connect with local sports teams related to the films that we were showing. Uh, we have a strong social justice bent. So whatever issue was being addressed. And so those community partners, so it, I think that did have a very uh, pretty hyper local for such a niche kind of genre. Um, however, <clears throat> on March 8th, we had launched a crowdfunding campaign <laughs> through uh, I Fund Women, which is a platform that funds female entrepreneurs um, through with Adidas. And we were going to be doing a 12 city roadshow of taking the festival across the country because we too, really believe in the power of gathering in person. So that was, um, has been put on hold. <laughs> uh, but to answer the question, that first foray into going nationally would have been connecting with folks who were doing similar work in other communities across the country. And that was why I wanted to take the festival there because people had, hadn't been able to access the films and, and enjoy the concept, so. Right. Um, kind of going, going off of that, um, you know, speaking, both of you speaking about sort of the importance of the, the interaction and the interactive elements of an in-person festival, what, that could be the answer, but what, what were your concerns, um, from a, sort of an audience standpoint when you decided to go online? Um... We had two concerns. One is that a lot of our audience is drawn from the Southern region, about a five state region, but primarily in our county, which is Lafayette County in Mississippi, there's a lot of pockets of no internet access at all. 
So suddenly saying, well, watch us online didn't really solve the problem for some of our audience. That's why we really had to consider a safe hybrid option and developed the drive-in later because we have people that have been showing up to watch every single film at the drive-in because they don't have internet at home. So it's giving them some sort of outlet. Um, and then the second being a big part of our festival is the hospitality. We feed the filmmakers three meals a day. We provide way too much alcohol to be safe. <laughs> we have bowling parties and, and that sort of interaction is not something we could recreate online, but we have had private Zoom meetings with filmmakers that we just sat there and chatted. Um, we had a great online offline discussion about Black Lives Matter with a bunch of different filmmakers from all over the country. Um, so just still providing a way to connect in some way. We know it's not the same, obviously, but just providing that sense of connection. I mean, getting to talk to Susan and Daniel and Clay here feels good to me. So, you know, doing something. I think my concern was that there were a pretty significant percentage of young people who access the film through a coach or teacher, um, either bringing them to the festival or coming to our, our, our Girls' Day focused programming, and that, um, that we wouldn't be able to reach those um, young people uh, virtually because of not having a direct connection to them or not assuming that they have access to laptops and internet. Um, so that's been just taking it, that will require a different approach, I think. Definitely. Yeah, so I guess from my perspective, um, I think, you know, fundamentally the fact, the fact that we were kind of starting from zero when it came to concerns, kind of really kind of mitigated any any real risk for us. Like I think once once we kind of decided to take it online, it really just became much more of an opportunity just to kind of, you know, be a bit more ambitious and just kind of experiment more and kind of like test some things out. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that I did was, you know, immediately kind of expanded the program out um, and kind of focus, I guess, the marketing and kind of PR push on onto like a more, you know, on a national level, essentially. Um, I guess one of the concerns there was that, you know, we we kind of worked, we're working very closely with with local, like local partners, local to San Francisco. And so I guess adapting the messaging to make that appealing to a broader audience. Um, so, you know, our festival was, was presented by, co-presented by the Bay Area Video Coalition. Um, and the proceeds from the festival benefited three local nonprofits. Um, so Gareth NSF, who is a local nonprofit that kind of works with the Latin American um, population here in, in San Francisco Bay Area, um, and also two venues in the Roxy Theater and Artist Television Access, um, who kind of came on board super early and kind of supported us and you know were in place to essentially host what was going to be the, the kind of the physical in-person event. And so kind of understanding how, you know, how to, I guess, you know, present that and convey that as a proposition that, that would translate um, nationally was, you know, was, was a bit, a bit of a challenge um, considering they're very much, you know, San Francisco based projects. But in the end, I don't, you know, I don't think it really like dissuaded anyone truly. And we were still able to kind of get support on a national basis from various kind of publications. But our primary focus was was still very much on a on a local level. Cool. Um, I, I guess flipping the the conversation or the question a little bit, um, especially for for those of you with established festivals, had you heard anything um, from your established audience in terms of of their concerns with a move online or any questions that they had um, prior to to you? Uh, you know, actually doing online programming. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, initial out of the gate question was, well, I don't want to watch it on my phone. Um, there's just an automatic misunderstanding that if it means virtual, there's no other way to watch it but your phone. Um, so just that education process of how to stream onto your TV, or if you can't, how to use an HDMI cord, all those basics for some of our audience that traditionally at regional festivals is not necessarily as tech friendly. Um, and so that was, I think, the first hurdle to overcome with audiences. And then 
the ones that do like interacting, just being able to actually um, talk with the filmmakers. I love StreamYard. I love how Seedensburg does it because I can see everybody's lovely chats on YouTube. Um, hi, Larissa and Baldwin. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that is sort of providing that interactive, interactive nature for people who love getting to talk to the filmmaker, I think is so important. So. Yeah, Susan, any concerns from, from your audience um, that were sort of incoming inbound? Um, not so much. I think that there were a num there were a fair number of people who'd been watching us from afar and were really excited that they could access the festival for the first time. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that Susan same. That was the yeah. positive is mm -hmm. the films that didn't didn't geo block to Mississippi only have had the most success because one, we're a college town and 50% of our population had to go elsewhere back to their hometowns, which is not in Mississippi. And so a lot of our traditional audience, unless you know they happen to still be in Mississippi, couldn't interact with the films. So all the films that are USA or global have been having much better success. Right. Um, I'm curious, just going off of that, given that you, you know, there is sort of this silver lining situation of being accessible to a larger audience. How did that inform any of your sort of audience building uh, through marketing or outreach um, in terms of of capitalizing on that on that opportunity? Well, Clay, I talked to you about this this week. It re it, re it revealed huge gaps in our strategy, <laughs> and so <laughs> that's okay. We're all. I, I just want to. I just want to set some context here for for the audience in that we're all. This is the wild west. Like we're all figuring this out, and and um and a huge part of of what I I hope you know this conversation is uh, will reveal for everyone is that you know. These are the opportunities we missed. This is what worked. This is what didn't. You know. Um, so absolutely, absolutely, Susan, if you want to keep going on that. Well, part of what happened, and Mel, so um, I'm a member of the Film Festival Alliance, which I think everyone out here is. And there was a Film Festival Day, which which has a uh, uh, sponsored by Film Festival Alliance, and we screened a film called Life and Synchro, which was about. Um, Synchronized Skating. It was a film that had begun its festival run. Wonderful, lovely film, Angela Panaglia. And she, um, and what, how that worked was Film Festival Alliance uh, sponsored it. And then there were like 35 affiliated festivals that uh, participated. And that meant that we could promote specifically to our communities. Well, um, and I was invited to moderate that panel because of the alignment with our mission. And, um, because the film had not been screened broadly where the uh, synchronized skating community had access to the film, there was, I, that's one of the reasons I, I'm gonna say what happened next was there was just a huge response. Like the film, the filmmaker received half of the box office and then the rest was split amongst the 35 festivals. And I think it grows, Melanie, wasn't like 16 or $17,000? Uh, something, Leela's uh, in, the chat, so maybe yeah. she put the numbers in there, but it, it was a good amount. And um, and our first film that Film Fest Alliance did, Phoenix, Oregon, also did really, really well. So sort of that collective nature of regional film fest partnering together seems to be a really great model. Um, so I headed into our first foray going, oh, this is gonna be easy. <laughs> Not so much, not so much. <laughs> and and part of what that was, was I did go into it with high hopes because I saw the power of that. But I think what happened what was a new film um, that hadn't been seen. There was a super activated and motivated community that was going to get to see themselves reflected. And then there was a very, uh, Angela and her team were did all, all of that footwork that made it look so easy um, is now the work I'll be engaging in moving forward. Um, but it was very heartening to see how successful it was and how powerful it was for to reach so many people who 
Um, I know we're going to get to this, but like if that film had gone directly to Netflix, we wouldn't have had the shared experience. It wouldn't have been, there was a community experience. And, and that, and Melanie, didn't you show the film after that? I yeah. Know what your experience was. It was scheduled for later in the um, festival run. So for those who don't know us, we were one of the first to pivot. We were supposed to be March 18th through 22nd physically. So we've been doing our virtual fest since April 24th and it ends August 14th. Um, partially because we have a very small team. So one staffer is running a drive-in, I'm running the virtual fest. So it's been very chaotic. Um, but also because at the time, a lot of fall festivals are like, oh no, we're gonna be normal. We're not gonna worry about filmmakers. I loved what Seed and Spark did with their pledge because a lot of festivals committed um, to not caring about premieres, to really helping the filmmakers not just fall off the map this year. So we, had a lot of films that were afraid in the beginning. And so we had to wait. And so Life in Synchro was one of those. She was going to be later. But luckily, because of the Film Fest Day, we were able to play it the same week and push people to that shared bigger event, which was a lot of fun. But then we partnered with Sidewalk Film Fest because Kiwi, uh, who works for them, is a syn was a former synchronized skater. So she did the Q&A for us, which was well beyond me, who <laughs> knows nothing about sports. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's great. I mean, for, so Daniel, for, I mean, obviously like all, everything was new for you this year. So um, sure. I'm, I'm curious if, if you had sort of like a shift in your strategy once you, in terms of like um, either PR approach or um, again, outreach or marketing to really hit a larger audience than, than, um, than just like the, the local Bay Area audience. Sure. So yes, yeah, so I think one one of the main I mean, one of the main decisions that that we made honestly was you know going with with Seed and Spark. I think like having that kind of you know that trust and and understanding how effective I guess Seed and Spark is in terms of its marketing. I really made a push to you know be within the first batch of uh, of festivals, um, which you know definitely took some like scrambling and was like a lot of work, but. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that, that we kind of did that. Um, and I think through that process, we like definitely kind of learned a lot and it gave us, you know, it definitely gave, kind of gave us a boost. I think with, with this being the first edition, it was always, you know, part of the job of any marketing that we did was really around kind of credibility and kind of really building a, a foundation essentially that we could then kind of grow from and move forward for, for future editions and for the other kind of projects and initiatives that, that we're kind of setting up at the moment. So um, definitely still focused, you know, a lot on, on local on local press, local publications, outlets here in the Bay Area. We got a lot of like really great support from, you know, like the, the SF Chronicle, SF is kind of mission local, a lot of kind of support across social media as well. Um, and then we were also able to, you know, reach out to, as a result, being able to kind of go national with it, reaching out to other broader kind of Latinx um, outlets and media companies. Um, so, you know, places like La Mezcla and Mito, who supported us a lot through their kind of, you know, huge social channels. Um, you know, with like really massive reach, you know, in terms of our kind of like live Q and A's. Um, Mito shared both of those to their Facebook audiences, which, you know, have in, in excess of 4 million, um, kind of audience numbers. And so that's, you know, an opportunity that we probably wouldn't have of, like pursued really um, without it, you know, without it being available nationally um, and without it being online for sure. And also just other kind of, I guess, film specific um, kind of publications, places like Movie Maker. And so that, that definitely, it definitely opened a lot of doors for us in, in that sense. And, you know, I think it's kind of allowed us to kind of really rethink what, what we could do. It was, it was, it was far less kind of limiting in that sense. So that's, that's definitely something that I think will in turn kind of serve the local community here as, you know, kind of continue to grow and kind of build on that. So our focus is definitely still kind of maintaining that that core, that foundation um, here in, in the Bay Area. Of course, yeah. Um, I, I guess going off of that, um, I'm sure a lot of people that are tuning in now are, uh, I, are curious about things that have worked for you um, all in, in both engaging your existing audience and uh, acquiring or attracting new audience. 
both from a marketing standpoint, from a PR push standpoint, um, you know, what are the things that that you've sort of learned thus far in terms of like um, specific ways that you would approach it differently moving forward, or or perhaps next in the next iteration? Yeah, I um, found very quickly. No matter what we do, it's only we get tuned out after a while because it's like, oh, there's Melanie posting again. Um, <laughs> but really, really working with the filmmakers, um, Larissa and Baldwin, who I shouted out earlier that are on this, they did an amazing job of engaging their pre-built-in audiences from their previous short that's about their feature they played with us. Um, and so they were putting out newsletters, they were doing social media. Um, Larissa is also a singer, she was doing some great stuff. and. Meanwhile, they are Asian American. And so there was a lot of issues going on in their community at the same time. Um, and so there was a lot of great, healthy conversation weeks and weeks and weeks before the film ever played. Um, and they had the most successful run of our fest um, because of that. So as much as I'd like to say, oh yeah, the festival can do this and this, it's partner with your filmmaker and make sure that they are also building their audience with you because you don't have the lobby for people to be like, oh, what did you see? What should I see? So that's now your new lobby is the filmmaker and you going out to your audience together. Um, what, what I wanted to say when I realized that after this first run that there were some new strategies that I needed to engage, um, the Seed and Spark resources, I'm just gonna be a big commercial for this. Like Brie Castellini was, and Christina Ray were in my ear and they told me what to do and I didn't take their advice. And now I am taking their advice and my team is, we're studying the content that they put out and to know that um, that no matter, that we're here for the long haul in terms of, um, that this, like we don't know when we'll move on, we'll mm -hmm. be able to have live events again. And I think that even when we can, we'll all, we'll do a hybrid model. And so to take a slower approach and a more thoughtful approach to building our community. And one thing when we, the three films we chose were films that we had screened in the past. Um, and I, I feel like we, I, I could go in a couple of directions. I want us to talk about the opportunities that happen when with, uh, because everyone's home and who can moderate your panels. Sure. But, um, but just the the opportunity to with this new with our second edition that we'll be working with new films that our community has not seen before, um, some films that um, haven't been able to have their premiere yet and are willing to do this, or um, films that maybe just where we can partner, just like you're saying, Melanie, with the filmmakers. And one of the reasons I I chose Seed and Spark was because of your point of view and because of it how it aligned with my own mission to like my fundamental goal is to get people to watch to, for as many people as possible to see these films and then to support those storytellers in having a long and fruitful career because it makes me really sad when I talk to really good filmmakers who talk about how hard it is to do this work and 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 whether it's feasible for them to keep creating and so I want to be part of that solution and I feel like I know Seed and Spark is is also part of that solution so to team up with you and to um to be very explicit about that and and then how we can do more robust programming outside of the films. Um, and I mean, if we're just kind of flowing with this, I, the Q and A's I've never seen, like after an hour, like, okay, let's wrap it up. And, you know, we go on for 10 or 15 more minutes. And the Q and A's are just of a quality that I've just, you know, I know everyone misses that opportunity in person, but the quality of the conversations that I saw for us and then what I've observed at other festivals is is really remarkable. And I'm curious what Daniel and Melanie have experienced with that. Susan, I agree. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been having these hour long, fantastic conversations. Uh, Julie, who's on here, her short 7A Wednesday, we paired with her name is Joe. And so they found an organization, Project Avery, and brought them in um, to help do that nationwide reach for their film and just the conversation with them it's two filmmakers in a physical screening we'd have like a 15 minute talk and then you know get everyone out instead i was like oh my god it's already an hour we have to stop um, you know it's so great and that's something that's going to inform our physical screenings in the future to build more collaborative discussions around yeah i think for for us 
the, I guess, you know, through, through Season Spark support and the, you know, the opportunity to be able to do the online events and basically have participation from filmmakers that, you know, otherwise wouldn't have probably made it out to, to San Francisco and um, to interact with audiences. I think one of the, one of the main things that we really kind of want to focus on in terms of, you know, the films and the stories that we choose and the filmmakers that, you know, we're essentially kind of getting behind is like really truly kind of celebrating them as much as possible. We had quite a, you know, we had a, a small, a small enough kind of program. So two blocks of shorts, I think nine in total. Um, and these are, you know, ranging from, you know, across the whole, the whole kind of region. So from Brazil to Cuba, Colombia, Venezuela, um, Ecuador, Mexico, etc. Um, and being able to, to give that platform to the filmmakers was like incredible and just, you know, from my conversations with them, understanding how kind of appreciative they were of that and even just the generosity of, of the moderators, you know, so we, again, kind of on that kind of like local focus, we had Colin um, Chavarro, director of Jurassic World, um, Safety Not Guaranteed, who's, you know, he's, he's native to the Bay Area. He, um, you know, let us know in the, in the Q&A that, you know, he's a, a frequent visitor to the Roxy. Um, when he was when he was a teenager when he was younger growing up here <laughs> and so to kind of have that that connection was was incredible and he was you know he made the like amazing gesture of inviting as a kind of a special surprise guest um Daniela Pineda who is a Mexican American actress from Oakland um who is in um a Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom and so she was able to come on and kind of speak to the filmmakers and you could just see their generosity in terms of you know having like genuinely watched all the films, being really interested and, and, you know, ended up being, I don't know, like an hour and hour and 20 minutes, maybe. Um, yeah. So, and that was, that was just like an incredible, incredible experience. And even with our, our other kind of Q and A that we brought in, um, film writer, uh, Carlos Aguilar, who is based in LA, who's an incredible writer. Um, and again, it was just such a, you know, just such a great and kind of like beautiful experience just kind of watching watching these interactions and, and seeing you know these short films that you know otherwise wouldn't be you know shared and kind of celebrated in this way probably in theaters in in san francisco or in the us or anywhere really um the kind of visibility is limited to be able to kind of extend that and, and celebrate them in you know in ways beyond just purely screening the films and that's something that you know we really focus on even in terms of our own kind of like marketing activity and the way that we kind of represent everything like visually really putting that kind of time time and care into into elevating each each and every project and this kind of gave us an opportunity to you know to build on that um <clears throat> i want to just go back to something that that melanie touched on which is uh, really utilizing the the reach of your filmmakers um, to get the word out about the larger festival. Um, you know, I, we we've seen it time and time again from from you know our crowdfunding side to our um, pay what you can subscription streaming side that the most successful films um, in terms of viewership and and in this case ticket sales are those that really activate their own audience. Um, and so any filmmakers that are, that are watching here, if you are participating in an online festival, uh, you like do the work to help the festival and it, and it will all, it will help the entire ecosystem and the entire, uh, you know, lineup of films that are participating in that festival. And similarly, um, to all the festivals watching, make it easy for them. Um, I would say, you know, and, and I'm happy to hear from any of you uh, uh, about, you know, what you've done in terms of, of creating, you know, laurels is one thing, but creating sample posts for Twitter, for, for Instagram, whatever, um, to make it simple for filmmakers to communicate all of the necessary information to their audiences. Um, but before we move on that, I just, off of that, I just want to see if, if any of you had anything to add. 
Um, well, we um, did a revenue split with the filmmakers in hopes of incentivizing them <laughs> to share because then they get the money. Um, and that seemed to work for those who were motivated. Um, but we, I, there's lots of things we didn't do right. Um, I'll definitely have like a very simple, here's how to best practice virtual fest with us for next year because it was sort of like learning as we went. So I was like, oh yeah, we should tell them about this <laughs> like two weeks in. Um, so just being prepared very early on and not midway like we were is is beneficial. Um, something that I'm totally stealing uh, that I learned from another festival, Dead Center, they had a 24 hour Zoom that was their green room. So you could pop in at any time. And that's such a simple thing to do that we didn't think of. Um, so just, I think we're all figuring it out this year. Mm -hmm. All of us can come back in like January and be like, okay, here's what to really do. <laughs> yeah. Melanie, could you talk a little bit more about the revenue split? Uh, split? I saw Larissa Lamb's comment on that. And um, I think you're right that that's part of this whole new model too. Yeah. Of, uh, and so if you could say a little more. We wanted to do that anyway. San Diego Underground Film Fest, Ryan Bashart has been doing it for a couple years. Um, and, you know, just like in the reality of any film, features are obviously going to fare better than shorts. People don't necessarily, a lot of pass holders will go watch a short block. But they won't spend the money to invest in shorts. So you see a, a lot more of the features doing better, obviously. We do a 50% split with them. Shorts blocks, we do an even split. So if there's eight films, you know, it's divided in nights. Um, and we, started with a $10 ticket model, but we changed it to pay what you can, um, which has mostly worked out great. Some people pay $3, some people to pay 20. Um, so it really balances out the pricing. Um, and we have, not every filmmaker made money. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. there are streaming costs and if only pass holders selected, I'm like, here's your minus $4.99, <laughs> sorry. Um, but- I yeah, I will say that, like, even at that, like, most the the norm has been that most festivals don't pay you anything. So, <laughs> yeah, so, at least trying to pay them something is right. Great, <laughs> um, but yeah, like we've actually paid a few filmmakers over a thousand dollars. So um, it's been both rewarding and really depressing when I have to report to them, <laughs> here's your nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've been very transparent about the whole thing. They get their audience reports. They get all the information. Um, so we're really working as a distribution model for them, um, which I think is a really critical thing for regional fests in this new virtual world to serve as, which I think is what Film Festival Alliance is trying to do as well, going back to what Susan, Susan talked about. Absolutely. Um, so on the theme of, of utilizing the resources you have to make as much noise as you can to drive those, those ticket sales and drive that viewership, uh, something that I've, um, has been, it doesn't sound like a rocket science at this point, but it has been a little bit of an eye-opening experience for me. I've, I've at, at this point talked to about 200 festivals, I think. And um, because there is this entire shift in business model from an in-person event, unless you're doing something hybrid like you are, Melanie, um, to an online business model, um, there's a sort of a lot of things that go with that and a lot of, of learning and uh, learning curves that go with that. Um, and you know, so um, one one piece of that is is understanding that you are now competing in a different marketplace in terms of of not only competing against other festivals that are going online and perhaps are also not tightly geo blocked, um, but also to the other streaming content that's already available that people are already subscribing to. So. Can you can you talk about anything you want to here? Like either like the things that you like never thought you'd have to deal with, the things that you've tried um, in terms of how you communicate the value of supporting, you know, taking a break from Netflix this week to support this festival. You know, what what things are have you tried? What are you what are you how are you thinking about this? Yeah, um, for us. Uh... 
and I think for all regional festivals, it's about the curatorial voice because I talk about this all the time. We're 45 minutes away from Indy Memphis and three hours from Sidewalk, but all three of our festivals program completely differently. So even though technically we're in the same geo block area, it's very different festivals. What Rachel Morgan is gonna play at Sidewalk in Birmingham is not what Miriam Bale is doing at Indy Memphis or what Donna Kozlowski is doing at Oxford. Um, and so really continuing to support that local curatorial voice is what we're arguing for, but also it's no different than if you came to the Physical Fest, you're taking a break from Netflix that weekend too. Now it helps maybe more for someone like our festival that's been around before YouTube <laughs> because people were used to us being a content creator well before there were so many other options. But at the same time, I think your Film Fest audience wants to support and find those unique stories that they can't find on Netflix. So however you're presenting it, that's an easy sale. That's the easiest part I think of all of this is saying, hey, we're still supporting great films, come see them. Um, how you market it though, I don't know, it's still up in the air. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So mm -hmm. <laughs> depends on what's getting released that week, I think. Yeah, I think from, from our perspective, similarly, I think around, you know, the kind of the curation, the program and, and just beyond that kind of, just having that kind of distinctive kind of identity and proposition in terms of what, what stories we're putting out there and who, who they're for, essentially. I think looking at the content, the kind of content that, that we're programming and the audience that we're kind of going after, whether that is you know, kind of the, the Latin American kind of diaspora or kind of those who simply want to kind of connect and learn more um, with the culture. Um, I don't, you know, we wouldn't really anticipate tons of crossover in terms of actually direct competition for eyeballs with, with the likes of um, Netflix, Amazon and whatever other kind of streaming services um, may be out there. But I think, you know, I'm also, I think it's also something that we're kind of trying to understand a bit more um, just because I feel like people's like consumption behavior at the moment is, you know, is not what it was like back in like January, February. There's, um, there's very different, I feel like patterns to, to what people are watching and what they're kind of consuming. Um, so yeah, you know, I've, I've started kind of having conversations and calls with, with people who attended our online festival to kind of get a better understanding of that, um, and see how, you know, how can we, we can essentially accommodate those insights and kind of use those to inform what we're doing. But I think also, again, yes, yeah, the kind of the identity and making sure that there's something within Cineola that really marks it out as a kind of niche that, that really connects with that audience for us. You know, that's everything from essentially like ensuring that the kind of Latin American identity is really kind of entrenched in like every single aspect and like, you know, corner of, of how we're presenting ourselves which, you know, as an example, kind of the, the design and that visual identity that, that we have, something that we spent a lot of time on, worked with, you know, some incredible designers here in the Bay Area to make sure that it was really representative of, of the culture and, you know, is inspired by, you know, graphic design kind of movements from Latin America from like the 70s and kind of custom typefaces inspired by Mexican kind of street typography and kind of just like touches like that that I think, um, do a really important, important job of, of differentiation, essentially. Yeah, Daniel, because your festival was before mine, I was studying the other festivals and your, <laughs> oh my God, your work was just, it, the, the graphic design and the, the care and the thought, just really gorgeous, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we, we work with some <laughs> like incredible, incredible designers out here. To, to give them a shout out to so Omar Mohammed and Habib Pacentia and Jacob Alexander who put together the, the identity and the website and you know we, we spent a lot of time kind of studying you know kind of iconic Colombian graphic design they went away did a lot of research and they came back with this kind of custom typeface um, inspired by like a second of Mexican street signs and also kind of a, a Latin American very like political graphic design movement from from the 70s I believe and all of that kind of went into to inform, you know, what what we stand for, and have that reflected in in the identity, you know, visually, as it is in in the program as well. 
I feel like that is the answer to why we are not competing with Hulu, Amazon, or Netflix. Like that's just that kind of thoughtfulness and that kind of care. And when you care about the story behind the filmmakers and the organization and that curatorial point of view is just beautiful. I, I, mm -hmm. I just don't even, I don't know. I, yeah. Kudos to you. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I would say like, you know, um, the more you take yourself seriously in terms of how you're communicating who and what you are, um, the more I think audiences will take note as well and take you seriously. Um, I, there are a few questions coming in here um, from the audience and I wanna make sure that, that we get to. Um, uh, one just quick thing is, is just confirming the percentage that Oxford gave to the, the filmmakers. Yeah, um, for features playing by themselves, 50% split. And then for shorts, we split evenly between the films. So depending on how many films there are was the percentage. So if there were nine films plus us, that'd be a tenth of the ticket sales for each. Wow. Um, can I just say something that we haven't said and it's such a helpful yes. thing for the nonprofit <laughs> film festivals, Google ads, the free ads they give you. We just shifted those from our call for entry ads to like targeting when there were films about a specific area or region, just really targeting those streaming films for that area was been really helpful. Thank you. That's that's mm -hmm. great. Any any other like like tips like that? I think are would be super <laughs> helpful. To yeah. Share in this yeah. Forum. yeah. 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 No, note taken, Melanie. Note taken. <laughs> <laughs> no, Susan wrote that one down. <laughs> All of that. This is going to be easy. I've been humbled, and now I'm going to try everything except yeah. Facebook ads. I'm not going to do Facebook ads. <laughs> I, and I do want to say if that we used Facebook ads pretty effectively for live events and and that was a different time and I'm really committed to not using them now for a variety of reasons. I know. We are they are helpful though. They are effective. But no, but, people, <laughs> but the Google ads, I don't I don't mm -hmm. is there any reason why I shouldn't be using those? I don't know. I hope not, because they give them to us for free. So <laughs> they better stay good. <laughs> um yeah I um I, I think something else just to, to add on to in terms of what differentiates um, online festivals from the streamers, uh, the the big guns, um, is that that interactive component. And whatever way you're able to do it in terms of panels or Q and A's or uh, the virtual green room, I think is amazing for for filmmakers. Just going off of another question that came in here from ABF, I don't know what your name is, but <laughs> um, uh, just understanding how successful were you in doing virtual mixer types of events um, for opening or closing nights? Uh, do you have any tips to make these more successful virtually? Um, I'm not sure if the question is pertaining to specifically just like filmmaker only virtual uh, mixers or if it is also incorporating audience members, um, but if any of you can speak to that. Yeah, um, we had been using a private Facebook group each year for our filmmakers that so they start talking to each other before the fest. Um, we'll probably move to something else like Discord in the future, but that sort of helped to pre-warm them up before they were coming to the fest. So we already had that in place. Um, and then we held private Zoom events for filmmakers. Um, since we were so sporadic, the way we held our fest, we held them at different times. We'll probably have one last one as our closer. But then we did a public award ceremony, um, which was open to really anyone. Um, and so there was a private cocktail hour for sponsors and filmmakers. And then there was a public facing thing. Uh, and that seemed really fun. We tied in with local restaurants you could order an awards package to be picked up and delivered to your house. I don't know if people took this up on it or not, but we tried to remind people of the cool local part of Oxford, not just, hey, it's us on the screen again, so. That's great. Um, something I'll just mention, I, I um, worked with the Palm Springs Short Fest uh, again this year in um, producing their, their industry forum for the filmmakers, um, but, something that the programming team did was every other day of the week-long festival they did a happy half hour um for the filmmakers uh in a zoom 
and they they utilize the breakout room functionality in the Zoom um, so that every so often they would just randomly rotate you. Um, so you'd be thrown into a different room with a bunch of strangers, um, which was great because it sort of mimicked this like mingling kind of um, opportunity at a festival. Um, I mean, that was utilized primarily just for the filmmakers. It was it was meant to sort of in, so, you know be the uh, the filmmaker lounge, um, but I, I I think incorporating that type of thing with uh, to foster the connection between audience and filmmakers. If if the filmmakers are willing to participate, why not? Because, and certainly from a filmmaker perspective, I I encourage everyone, every filmmaker to, there is no bad opportunity to grow your audience. And if you can go into those virtual sessions and get people to, to buy tickets to your blo program block or your feature, and and sign up for your newsletter, whatever you need to do. This is a great opportunity for for that um, for filmmakers to build their audience as well. So, um, just want to slide that in there. Um, this is you know we're primarily talking about um, audience growth and and outreach in this session, but um, just quickly for the, with this question from Susanna Darwin. How are festivals handling short films which filmmakers have made available on streaming services like Amazon Prime or Reverie is just disqualifying? Not for us. I mean, we took the seat in Spark Pledge and um, we're not disqualifying anyone for being online in any way because at this point, a lot of film festivals are in survival mode. Filmmakers are in survival mode. We want to just highlight your film to our audience. And if they figure out a different way to do it, okay, great. They found your film. So. <laughs> Right. I mean, I think a lot of festivals have been, especially around short films, have been in the practice of, of not disqualifying um, for uh, previously being online and, or, or previously playing other festivals, particularly around shorts. I think um, the uh, feature situation is definitely more hairy and, and which is incredibly unfortunate um, in terms of just the pressures that the sort of D distributors and sales agents have put on the whole situation. Um, but, oh, Melanie, you're back. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's all good. I warned you uh, all there was rain in the area, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the rain kicked you out. Um, so, um, I, I guess I, I'd like to hear I know we have uh, a little time left, so if, it, if there's any other questions from the audience, please feel free to put those in the chat um, now so we can we can get to those. But um, kind of going full arc here, there theoretically will be a day when we are no longer living in a pandemic <laughs> um, and we're able to gather safely in person again which I think everybody can agree is like where the magic really happens um, for a festival. Um, what, if anything, you can isolate now, have you learned from what you've had to do in this online experience? Would you carry over into the next time you're able to present an in-person festival? Um, for us, we're going to be requiring captions um, mm. in 2021 for all mm -hmm. films. It's always been recommended before, but there's no reason for, to not be fully accessible from here on out. So that is kind of priority number one. Uh, priority number two is really looking at our model of cramming as many films in as possible and reconsidering that and really finding more breathing room to have those good discussions we're having virtually, um, but also understanding that there's lots of reasons people can't travel anytime, even outside of a pandemic. So always having a virtual um, follow-up to our physical fest will be implemented. And the, the um, ticket sale share with the filmmakers is something we'd been wanting to do. So now that we were able to implement it this year, we're not gonna take that back. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's a great, good point. <laughs> yeah. I would just echo and agree with what Melanie said. And you know, part of our mission is that um, women in sports only get 4% of the media coverage, although we represent 40% of participants. And so 
uh, even though the, I have sort of multiple missions with the festival, that is one of them. And so uh, being part of the solution to that and creating, uh, moving the needle on that is, is something that I feel now being able to offer in person, someday offering in person and online just makes it, I feel more hopeful about that. I'm more hopeful about achieving that mission. Um, yeah, I guess for, for Cineola, you know, once we go back to in-person events, I think this is, you know, kind of been a good exercise in terms of, you know, really thinking about how, how digital and online can play a part in the festival experience and kind of using it to kind of enhance what we're doing in the in-person events, I think that we'll definitely kind of be retaining an online element um, to any of the festival events that, that we're doing in the future. And then in terms of kind of audience building, you know, the the festival for us is, is kind of only one part of, of what we're kind of trying to build. And so continually having other kind of, you know, essentially kind of just either releases or kind of like stimulus, I guess, for our audience in terms of what we're pushing out um, that, you know, when, when it exists within an online space, just making sure it's very much kind of tailored for, for that experience, um, and for that, you know, for that medium, essentially. Um, so we're, for example, we're kind of working on, on distributing a, an interactive documentary from a Mexican filmmaker that's based in the Bay Area. Um, and that's very much, you know, a format that's tailored to, to the medium and kind of that medium of, of being online and, and the viewer being in in control, um, not just simply kind of streaming the film and, and replicating what's happening in, in the theatre experience and actually expanding on it, kind of give the audience a bit more you know, auton autonomy um, and kind of more participation in, in the story. Yeah. Hey, Clay, um, can I uh, answer Dela's question about Sundance Channel? Yes. Um, Sundance actually used their travel funds for this year uh, with the NEA to make a nationwide collaboration. Um, so there are actually film festivals working under their umbrella and people involved with any kind of film organization in each region trying to build better networks and collaborations for all of us. So I don't know about films being on their necessarily channel, but they are doing a lot of behind the scenes work along with a lot of us um, that you're not seeing yet, but once things start getting rolling a little bit more, you'll see. So that might be one of the possible things and I'll take it back to the group and suggest that. I just wanna do a little shout out that uh, Sol is actually the director of a film called It Ain't Pretty about equity and women's surfing and you can catch that. Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, um, so we got a director there. <laughs> oh, cool, that's great. Yeah. Um, I there, there was a question here from Ariana um, what is the one thing that you wish you knew before you did a virtual festival? Uh, for us, I think it was how much of a film fest audience really does not like watching stuff at home. Like they really do it because they don't want to just be watching a film. They're going to the festival just for the camaraderie of other people like movies. Um, I wish we had thought more about really building out fun Zoom parties for our audience too, not just taking care of our filmmakers. So just making sure everyone's really accommodated. I think it's staying open and not making assumptions about who you think your audience is. Mm. Um, I know a big one for us is a lot of times like, uh, I just assume, oh, well, athletes are absolutely gonna wanna watch this. And how we, one of the biggest comments we get is like, I don't even like sports and I love this film festival. Um, I'm not a sports fan. And so it's an interesting, um, it's just an interesting way to reach an audience who doesn't identify as a sports fan and yet loves these stories. And so that's been very interesting. And talking, as Daniel said, talking to people who did engage and really enjoyed it and what they enjoyed about it and what they would want more of. Yeah, yeah I think from my side, I would probably think about almost having, having more confidence in having a, a shorter, more concentrated burst of activity. I feel that maybe we got into the realm where you end up competing with more of a film streaming audience by the fact that we had our, 
our festival available for a, a full kind of week. Um, and I think having more of a focus on on kind of events and and concentrated activity and something that more closely I guess replicates that sense of community and intimacy and like shared watching that a festival has um, may have have offered a more yeah kind of intimate experience for for the audience. That's definitely a consideration. Daniel, can I ask you, ask you about that? Because for me, I was thinking, oh, if it's this limited time, do you eliminate people who were like, oh, I'm mm. doing something else? But but you feel like it might be the opposite or you're going to experiment with that? Yeah, I guess that, that's kind of, yeah, something that has kind of been going around in my head. I feel like just having almost that kind of like ceremony of like, you know, we're getting together, we're watching this on this certain day and it's a shared experience. That burst of activity kind of gives, I think from a, from a marketing perspective as well, there's just far clearer messaging in terms of like watch this at this time on this day together and share with other people as opposed to this is available for a week. And then I think the, the impact can then kind of essentially, you know, become diluted over the period of, of that time. There's no real kind of concentration. Um, but even, even a week, you know, I, I felt that that was kind of short enough, but I don't know. Maybe I do more around kind of building specific kind of like events or like watch parties where, you know, people could opt in to, to share the experience if they could at that time. And if not, they still had the other kind of six, seven days to, to, uh, to explore the program. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that's come up in, in conversations with, with the, with the audience members as well. So, so yeah, I'm sure there's no kind of right or wrong answer, but it's definitely something that, that I'm thinking about. I think that's critical. We're not a streaming business. We're an event business. So we need to eventize this experience. We're not just being mm -hmm. like, hey, watch these films like Netflix. Like we're building a community. It just happens to be online. Right. Um, well, I want to be conscious of everyone's time. So we have uh, somehow already gone through an hour. Um, but um, I wanted to just give a quick opportunity for any of you to to give any last words of advice to festivals that are considering going online or are already in the process of, of moving their festivals online? Um, give yourselves more time to practice new skills if you're not used to streaming. And don't just decide for your audience and your filmmakers. Collaborate and discuss with them before you make your decisions. Bring them into the fold. Um, I would say just iterate and try. What, what, I think it would, Clay, you're always saying it's just spaghetti on the wall. Just like try it, see what works. And just to know that this is a time of great opportunity and innovation at, a, at the same time that there's just so much um, breakdown and, and challenges and grief and to just pace your, personally pace yourself as well. Um, and to just know that you're part, you're, you are, convening a, a country or people that need this kind of connection at this time. So to just balance that uh, practical with this, the good work of what art does at a time like this. Yeah, I think similarly, I think there's just, there's such a scope for kind of experimentation um, in terms of what's going on. I think one of the benefits as well is that a lot of that experimentation has already happened. A lot of those like, you know, mistakes and learning from you know, our three festivals and like numerous others across the world. So there's a lot that you could just dig into by just seeing what, what's been done elsewhere and what's worked and what hasn't. And even just, re I guess, just like reaching out to people like us or other, other festivals and even kind of audience members um, just to kind of get, get that information. Yeah, I think that's a great note to, to end on. I think anybody that's watching right now that's from a festival would be willing to you know, share what they're, what they've learned. And, um, you know, if, if you're with a festival that's not part of the Film Festival Alliance, or you're not uh, familiar with the Film Festival Alliance, they're a great resource. Um, they present regular uh, conversations, I, I think, weekly um, about different topics um, uh, in terms of how to support festivals during this time. So definitely check that out as a resource. Um, we are always also here, um, Seed and Spark, so feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, I want to uh, thank you to a, our incredible group of, of, of festival organizers that have joined us here today. Thank you so much, Daniel, Susan, Melanie, for your 
words, for your uh, learnings, for your shortcomings, for all of the things that you've shared here. Um, yeah, thank you. Our candor. All, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's all, it's all very, very helpful. Um, thank you to the audience for tuning in. Um, we are doing a, a few things coming up that I just want to shout out. Um, we have a uh, the distribution download workshop as well as the crowdfunding to build independence workshop both tomorrow um, and this Friday. We are having a creative sustainability session with Jeff Nichols on creating uh, uh, creating in non coastal communities. Um, and next week's lunch and learn um, is going to be uh, with the binge web series creators and remote uh, on remote production hacks. Um, so if you are filmmakers thinking of how to create during this time, that would be a good one to tune into. Um, check the comments to find links to RSVP to all of those events. Um, and as a reminder, if you are able, we'd love to continue. Uh, we'd love your support to continue bringing these awesome events uh, to you for free. Um, check out the link in the video description and in the comments to contribute um, whatever you're able to um, if you found today's workshop uh, valuable. So thank you again to everyone, and um, we will see you next time. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs>